Hello and welcome to those joining us in the room and online today. Um, on behalf of Rice360, uh, it's my pleasure to host our Summer Global Health Seminar. And we are very excited to welcome Dr. Amr um, Hashmi, uh, who is a faculty associate at the Institute of Implementation Science at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center, Houston. He has 15 years of global health experience, including eight years living and working in low-income countries. Um, Dr. Hashmi will be presenting on uh, mixed methods research on newborn care interventions among vulnerable populations along the Myanmar-Thailand border. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Hashmi to the front. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, well, thank you guys for having me today. Uh, I'm really excited to be here uh, and join you all and uh, just chat a little bit about my own work, uh, which I hope is kind of in line with a lot of what you guys do at this wonderful program. Uh, so uh, I am, as was mentioned, a faculty associate at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center here in Houston. Uh, which I just found out is just across the street <laughs> from you guys, so that's pretty great. Um, I didn't, as y'all were under my nose the entire time. Um, and I've been there for about a year, um, and I also have an appointment in the School of Public Health in the Department of Health Promotion and Behavioral Sciences. Uh, a little bit of a background about me, yes, I have done global health for a little while, uh, but uh, my first love was always public health. And I started with a master's in public health from Boston University, and that's really when I started doing global health work. I uh, came back and uh, did, an, did an MD at UTMB in Galveston, uh, and I spent some time in Boston uh, kind of pretending to be a doctor. Didn't really like clinical care too much and went back to my first love, which is public health. So I have a bit of a meandering past, so maybe some of the students or, or uh, some of your fellows uh, might appreciate uh, that meandering path yourselves. Uh, but yeah, today I'd like to talk to you guys about some of the work that I've done on the Myanmar-Thailand border, uh, working on newborn care interventions. Um, so I'll continue on. A little bit of an overview of what we might discuss today is uh, I'm going to start talking to you guys about some of the work that we've done around jaundice, or neonatal uh, hyperbilirubinemia, uh, on the Myanmar-Thailand border. And I know that you guys have a thriving program in Sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa actually share a lot of commonalities uh, when it comes to this uh, disorder or condition. Uh, and I, uh, I know you guys are the tech gurus. And so we're going to talk a little bit about innovations that we've tried on the Thailand-Myanmar border. But you guys are definitely expert in that field. Uh, the lens that I kind of bring is kind of that part two, which is implementation science. So I like to think about innovations, but I also like to contextualize it and think at a few different layers as to where those interventions are taking place or, or where we place our innovations. And so I hope to have a, a nice, deep, rich discussion with you all about that. Uh, and then for the third part, uh, and, and a bit of vulnerability, uh, I've, I've taught myself mixed methods research over the years. That wasn't technically my background. But you kind of apply yourself to the problems that are at hand, oftentimes in global health. Uh, and as I've learned more, I hope that I've become more sophisticated in my thinking uh, and trying to pull in some of that implementation science work. Uh, but full caveat, I've really only been uh, immersed in implementation science for about a year. And it turns out that a lot of my mixed methods research and, and methods that I had learned over the years was quite in line with a lot of implementation science. So hopefully. Uh, we'll do a little, little bit of a briefer, uh, a brief on uh, implementation science and see if it might have uh, some thoughts or ideas or frameworks for you guys to think about in your own work. So here we are on the Thailand-Myanmar border. Um, and in the foreground, oh, the picture doesn't come up so well. This might be slightly, in, there we go. So this photo is taken from the Thai side. Uh, and right across the river is Myanmar. And that's all that separates it for about 2,500 kilometers, about 1,500 miles or so. Uh, Myanmar is just separated from Thailand by a river. Uh, 
And migrants reside on both sides of the Thai-Myanmar border. So we're going to talk a lot about the migrant populations, and I'll get into that a little bit later. And the way that they get care, oftentimes in Thailand, uh, is that they just kind of ferry across on a little boat over there. And if you look really, really closely, that's probably me and a colleague just coming back from Myanmar. But don't tell anyone we were in Myanmar. Um, so uh, what am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to talk about the organization that I worked with, which is called the Shakalo Malaria Research Unit. Uh, and this is part of the University of Oxford system. Uh, it's now part of the Center for Tropical Medicine and Global Health. I believe that's its full title uh, at the University of Oxford. Uh, and really, they got their start almost 40 years ago. So uh, I, I know context is really important. I know that you guys spend some time learning and thinking about the context in which your interventions are going to take place. So I hope you guys can bear with me a little bit and enjoy the story, perhaps. Um, 40 years ago, there was a lot of violence. Uh, the Myanmar government had, had a program to forcibly displace a lot of the uh, main ethnic minority that was uh, residing in eastern Myanmar. And so in the 80s, a lot of these uh, refugees sought asylum in Thailand. Uh, and through the 80s, Thailand had set up refugee camps for these communities that were displaced. Um, and that's kind of where the Shaklo Malaria Research Unit got its start. Uh, it was uh, the director of that, that unit is uh, a former MSFer, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, or Doctors Without Borders, a uh, French doctor. And the reason that it's called the Malaria Research Unit was because at that time, that's what was killing everybody. Uh, and so they decided that uh, they would take the lead uh, with a consortium of a number of different NGOs, uh, CBOs, different groups that were providing services to these refugees to prevent and treat malaria. <clears throat> and actually, they did some of the first clinical trials demonstrating the efficacy and effectiveness of artemisinin-based combination therapies, which we now know is part of the protocol for treating malaria across the world, as well as also kind of trying these treatments in pregnant women uh, to, to save both mother and child. Um, in the 90s, uh, Myanmar maybe had let up on its civil unrest, uh, but there was economic deprivation that had kind of set in. And so what happened was, uh, through the 90s, there were lax laws, labor laws, in Thailand that allowed for migrant communities from Myanmar to kind of crop up along the border. Uh, and these folks started coming over, uh, seeking the better health services and the better life that they, could, that they could find in Thailand. But unfortunately, both refugees and migrant communities were kind of left out of the Thai public health system, which, for as wonderful as it is, it didn't quite have the capacity to really address all the needs of those, those vulnerable populations. So uh, a lot of these migrants were also suffering from malaria. And so the Shakla Malaria Research Unit decided to expand its services from the refugee communities into the migrant communities to try to address and treat those problems. Uh, so I uh, had the privilege and honor of working with the maternal and child health department there. Uh, under the mentorship of a lot of really, really great researchers and practitioners. Uh, and they had set up uh, what I'm going to talk about a lot more today, which is uh, kind of the neonatal intensive care units. Uh, they follow the UK model, so they call them SCABOOs, which are special care baby units. And these were facilities that they started and, and really rolled out in force in about 2008. Uh, so I'll be, I'll be talking a little bit more about those services. Another note is that a lot of the services that are delivered here are done by people from these refugee and migrant communities. So they're locally trained. Uh, they're oftentimes uh, medics. They have a, a, a truncated uh, training program, but they essentially diagnose and treat common illnesses. There's midwives. There are ultrasonographers. Uh, there's a whole setup. Uh, and it's pretty much run by the local community, which is pretty fantastic. So, switching gears a little bit and talking about the physiology and pathophysiology of, of uh, jaundice, uh, I, I 
I'm sure you guys are probably <laughs> better at this topic than I am, but I'll give you a quick rundown if, uh, for some of us who might not be totally familiar with this. But basically, the baby is born, and the first few days of life are a little bit precarious. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, what happens is a increased uh, destruction of red blood cells, right? And so that might actually lead to higher levels of bilirubin. And the higher those levels get, uh, the more uh, dangerous it is for the baby. Uh, and we kind of think of this as a sink, <laughs> a faucet and a sink model, right? So the destruction of, of uh, uh, red blood cells leads to increased bilirubin in the blood. And the body's main, uh, main way of getting rid of it is through the gut and through the liver. Now, of course, in a newborn, these processes are a little bit immature. So sometimes they struggle with this. And so we think of this as maybe too much production of bilirubin versus the ability to actually get it out of the body. Um, so that's just a brief summary of that. Um, but in terms of the Thailand-Myanmar border, this is a particularly uh, uh, difficult issue. And I'm sure for many of your partners in Sub-Saharan Africa, this is also a problem as well. Uh, newborn jaundice, or neonatal hyperbilirubinemia, is generally benign. However, uh, what it requires is routine testing, care, and management in order to uh, help newborns get over this, this potentially precarious situation. Uh, in resource-limited settings, in particular, uh, we have higher risk for neonatal hyperbilirubinemia that can lead to increased risk for morbidity for the baby, uh, long-term effects that we can see from jaundice, as well as even mortality if it gets particularly bad. And something that makes South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa particularly um, special is uh, the risk factors that are involved in uh, uh, increasing the, the amount of jaundice that we see in newborns. So there's prematurity. We know prematurity is a big, big problem for a lot of us, and that's also a risk factor for jaundice. Uh, we also know that there are blood disorders, uh, not necessarily disorders, but genotypes and phenotypes that make infants more likely to have jaundice. Uh, and of course, as we see in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as South Asia, there's always the risk of infection that can actually make these problems worse. What exacerbates all of this is limited access to timely diagnosis and treatment. And there is kind of a requirement for well-functioning labs. And of course, our mainstay of treatment, phototherapy, which can be quite a uh, onerous undertaking. Uh, and what this has led to, and you guys are probably at the, are, are at the forefront of this, is the development and testing of point of care tests or innovations or technologies that can help with the early diagnosis, management, and treatment of things like jaundice or the risk factors that are precursors to them. And these are particularly important in a lot of the places that we work, including the Myanmar Thailand border. So I'm going to point out uh, my first study. And this is, again, with the vulnerability of I, I hope I got better over time. But the first time that I was asked to help on studies looking at technologies uh, around neonatal jaundice was because I could do mixed methods. Um, and so we were, we were interested in some point of care tests uh, that could have been used. Uh, but a real thread that I want to hit on today is thinking about effectiveness, right? How effective are these innovations that we're thinking about or these technologies or point of care tests, for example, uh, and how do we demonstrate that, as well as thinking about other considerations that are tied to the setting or the context. And those kind of get at implementation, right? You might have something that is effective and that works, but really there might be other questions around how to implement that thing that works. So thinking about that, we, we devised a mixed method study uh, and we wanted to demonstrate whether or not the Billy stick, which is a point of care test for serum bilirubin uh, levels in newborns. Uh, and we just wanted to see if it was accurate and effective in our environment, in our clinical setting. And we could use 
a, a laboratory gold standard to te test uh, serum bilirubin uh, levels, right? And that was actually based at the headquarters. So the clinics are a little bit, like maybe an hour or two away from uh, a nice big laboratory that can actually provide results within a day. But you can see the utility of the billy stick. If it works, you don't need as much of a, a laboratory resource uh, as is required usually. And then the part that I was really interested in was thinking about usability. And that, for me, was a question around implementation, right? So we have local healthcare workers, uh, some of them only with a high school education, but then went on for training locally uh, to become the uh, talented, trained staff that we have working those clinics. And we wanted to do observations of them using this, this tool. Uh, but we also wanted to have discussions with them using focus groups uh, and get their sense of, of how they felt about this technology as a sense of you know, implement, implementing this at a wider scale. Uh, and this is a picture of Billy Stick that I found. It, was, it made me chuckle. Uh, apparently, you know, Billy Stick comes from, the, from Europe, and here it looks like they're taking over the world. And apparently, be careful, African colleagues, they're coming for you first. So, um, so what do we do? Well, we had a number of eligible neonates based on criteria. I won't get into the details of it, uh, but if there are questions about it, I'm happy to take them. And uh, we performed a number of Billy Stick tests. Almost half of them uh, gave us errors, which is kind of rough. At the same time that we were doing Billy Stick, we also took a blood sample to do that validation with the gold standard at the laboratory at headquarters. Right, so we can actually compare what the billy stick was registering versus what the laboratory was registering. Uh, and what do we find? Well, uh, this is kind of confusing. Over time, there were two different readers that were used, so we kind of compiled all of the readers that we used, the different billy stick uh, options, uh, because this is real world, real world setting, right? So you know, technology gets better, as you guys know, pretty rapidly. Uh, but still, the error rates were still quite high, regardless of the reader that we were using. There's about 50, about half, like I mentioned before, were still uh, uh, causing errors uh, in terms of the uh, serum bilirubin levels that they were reporting. And this is particularly bad for high hematocrit levels in neonates, which, as some of you may know, uh, actually hematocrit levels in, in babies run kind of high. So this is not always applicable to a lot of the newborns that we see. Uh, also, we're a pretty tropical setting, uh, and we have high humidity levels, for example. So as those humidity levels rose, which I can attest having sweat and <laughs> uh, suffered a lot of this humidity over the years, that these machines performed worse as humidity levels rose. Uh, and this graph, the plane A over here, shows mm, lower humidity levels. And you can see how accurate and precise the machine is at detecting serum bilirubin compared to uh, pane B, in which uh, there's higher humidity levels. And you can see that dispersal is a little bit greater, uh, which is kind of a nice visualization of, yeah, it's not so accurate once you get uh, at higher uh, humidity levels. So, how do we score this? How do we score a billy stick? Well, I'll, I'll quote straight from the paper, given its lack of utility in younger neonates and its inaccuracy at high humidity and hematocrit levels, basically, we didn't really care to use it. Um, now, in terms of the usability, it was really easy to use. It didn't require a lot of training, but here's where context is important, right? Uh, if you're sitting there and you get an error for bilirubin on a child that you suspect might have jaundice, as a frontline healthcare worker, that's kind of anxiety provoking. And so that's, that's one of the key themes that came out in our discussions. That they, like, if they didn't have the laboratory backup, what would they tell the patients? What would they do for management and treatment? And also, it, had to require, it required a lot of blood sticks for the babies. And that was particularly traumatic for some of the parents. Uh, and that was another thing that came out. And it wasn't nice for the, for the healthcare workers to always be the bad guy taking blood from their babies, right? 
Uh, and the other additional thing to think about in context is also the technological support was actually rather high for this machine. Like it required someone that was kind of there that really knew how to work the machine uh, to fix some of, those, uh, some of those errors or to troubleshoot, right? So when we're starting to think about usability or implementation of this technology, we can see that, yeah, there's, there's other reasons to maybe rate it not so highly. Um, so part one, round two, uh, is the G6PD biosensor. Uh, so what is this? So, so I alluded to earlier that there are certain risk factors for, for jaundice. And one of them is this deficiency in an enzyme uh, it's a part of the makeup of red blood cells, and it's called glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. Uh, and as you see from the map over on the right, uh, it's a, a, a genotype and a phenotype that's seen throughout the world, especially in Asia, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Right? So this is one of those risk factors that's, that's particularly problematic for jaundice in a lot of, uh, of resource-limited settings. It's an X-linked trait, so males have got it bad, but uh, females, uh, uh, girl newborns, are also at risk for intermediate activity. So there's been a lot of development around this technology to try to see if we can understand and identify people, newborns, who might run a greater risk of jaundice. So what did we do? Well, we did another technical evaluation of this product, of this tool. Uh, and uh, we tested a bunch of newborns. We trained the midwives to be able to do it. Uh, what's great about this test is that it was not very invasive. So we didn't have to prick the baby anymore. But we could take blood from the cord, which is the usual thing that we do during deliveries, and identify those newborns that might have this deficiency. Uh, and we were able to test it in a few ways. One, we tested the biosensor itself. There's the fluorescent spot test that has also been uh, 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 put forth as a potential option for point of care use. Uh, and we again had that laboratory backup to, to give us that gold standard to compare. We trained a bunch of midwives, and I hope that we got a little bit more sophisticated in this usability assessment this time. Uh, we had actually partnered with PATH, the Program for Appropriate Technology in Health. There are also uh, uh, folks like yourself who are, who are interested in this, these types of technologies. Uh, but I wasn't, I wasn't too, too impressed with uh, what guidelines they had set up for us in terms of assessing usability. So I went to the literature, and I thought uh, about malaria rapid diagnostic tests and, and looked to some of those studies about how to characterize usability. So we thought about learnability, willingness to use uh, this technology, so appropriateness, acceptability, satisfaction, and of course, a qualitative measure of efficacy and effectiveness. We had the quantitative measure from the blood tests, but we could also assess, once again, by chatting with our health workers, how effective uh, they thought that uh, a technology was. Uh, and this is just a brief picture of the G6PD uh, uh, device, uh, easy to use, pretty, pretty straightforward instructions. Uh, but instead of actually if, you know, doing a finger prick, you can actually take blood straight from the umbilical cord and, and put that into the uh, biosensor. And that's how we did it for babies. So what did we find? Well, so just to point out again, we were kind of te testing two things. And the FST, or the uh, uh, fluorescent spot test, uh, was another point of care use, uh, uh, point of care test that can detect deficiency in this enzyme in particular. And we found that the biosensor did pretty well compared to other technologies, and did really and did quite well compared to the laboratory gold standard. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on the numbers. Uh, and because there's different levels of activity for this enzyme, which puts you at greater or more risk for having hyperbilirubinemia or higher bilirubin levels in the blood, we wanted to also see if it was sensitive and specific for, uh, some, for detecting this enzyme deficiency. 
And it actually did quite well. Um, again, I won't go too much into the weeds on this one. Um, but basically, you know, to summarize, what do we think about the G6PD biosensor? Well, we liked it a lot better than Billy Stick. Uh, we thought that where phototherapy is available, right? So you can't test someone and then not have the means to treat them if they need it, right? So where it was available, uh, we thought this test was a really, really good option. Um, it did well in terms of figuring out the phenotypes of the different types of uh, deficiencies that you can see in newborns. Uh, and it had a great sensitivity and specificity for, for finding those babies that might be at risk. Uh, and in terms of usability, implementation, uh, it was easy to use. The healthcare workers were happier because they weren't blamed for, for sticking babies too many times. And the parents were kind of more relaxed about it because it wasn't that invasive of a test. Uh, it needed some support, but not like Billy Stick. What it really needed was to make sure that there were visual aids enough to help the healthcare workers who oftentimes can have, you know, maybe lower health literacy, much like the communities that they come from, uh, in conducting what is a foreign test, right? Uh, and we thought that it might be, it might be good for, for resource limited settings in, uh, elsewhere or further in the field. Uh, and it led to early identification, counseling of parents and patients, uh, monitoring, prevention, and care, right? Because once we identify these babies that might be at risk, we could take a closer eye and observe them. All right, so what do we think about Biosensor? We thought it was good, <laughs> frankly. So I'm going to take a little detour. I just want to make sure on time, how, are you, how we're doing on time. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to take a little bit of a detour and talk a little bit about implementation science. So we have a, a nice crowd here. Uh, how many of you, raise your hands, have you heard of implementation science? The word. Okay. All right. Uh, keep your hand raised. How many of you have actually done implementation science studies or research? Uh, ish, ish, ish. And then the follow-on question for you, way in the back, the expert. Uh, how comfortable do you feel with implementation science concepts, methods? Okay, that's fine. I've, I'm still not either. But I'll try to, I'll try to share what I've learned <laughs> over the past year. Um, full disclosure, again, I'm a mixed methods researcher, and I only found out this year that I've been doing implementation science. I just never called it that. So hopefully these concepts are not too foreign to you all, uh, and maybe we can distill some of them down so they're so they're easier to digest and maybe even use in your own work. So for those of you who do know what implementation science is or is familiar, uh, can anyone offer me a definition of what you think it is? This is, this is one of those moments where I can take a break and you guys can talk. Any takers? Any takers? It's OK if you don't know. Yes. OK, great, yeah. Uh, gathering data on how well people can use a device or method. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, pretty good working definition. Anyone else want to help their friend in the back? Any other? And when we're thinking about it, uh, what exactly are we implementing when we say implementation? You were, you were, you were on the right track with your definition. Do we have any ideas what we're talking about when we're talking about implementation or what we're implementing exactly? Interventions. Great. You saw these slides beforehand, didn't you? OK. So I'll give you a textbook definition or one textbook definition. But implementation science is a scientific study. This is really a lot of words and verbiage. but. Scientific study of methods and strategies that facilitate the uptake of evidence-based practice and research into regular use by practitioners and policymakers. What does that really mean? It means we're trying to figure out how to bridge the gap between what we know, the evidence, and what we do, what we do in practice. Right? And there is where implementation science lies. Frankly, simply put, 
What are evidence-based interventions? Well, we follow the seven Ps, interventions, right? Well, what could those interventions be? Well, they could be programs, practices, principles, procedures, products, products like many of you have been involved in probably, procedures like many of you have been involved in, pills or policies. I have a friend in the crowd that loves policy, right? So those could be evidence-based that uh, are interventions that could be useful for health, period, right? And if you guys are interested in learning more about implementation science, there's a lot of wonderful resources on the web. Uh, the University of Washington has a great implementation science uh, uh, website. Lots of resources to read more about it. So well, why do I think this might be important or interesting to you guys? Uh, well, I'm going to try to simplify it again. I actually don't like this, but a, a, a thought leader in the field of implementation science came up with this, so I'll try to present it here. If you don't understand it, that's totally OK. <laughs> but basically what we think of is that evidence-based intervention, practice or innovation, right? Technological innovation, for example, is the thing. It's the thing. It's the thing that works, that's efficacious, that's effective. Effectiveness research about that thing is really thinking about how well it works by itself, right? Implementation research is about once we know that thing works, how to get people to do it. Implementation strategies are things that we can test about, <laughs> I'm using things way too much now, but it's the stuff that we do to try to get that evidence-based thing that we're interested in and try to get people in places to use it. And so the implementation research looks at different outcomes compared to effectiveness research, right? So a lot of effectiveness research, for example, the two studies that I highlighted earlier, we're talking about clinical outcomes or diagnosis. But implementation outcomes are really about how much or how well we're doing the thing that we know works. Is that okay? It's, it can be kind of convoluted. It gets very meta in implementation research in science. Um, so translational research, so I want to house this within translational research, which is where implementation science lies. And I think this might be more up your alley in terms of thinking about bench to practice. Uh, but we're thinking about having an intervention, technology, a thing, that we want to test and see if it's efficacious if it actually works. And if it does, and if it shows some effectiveness, we might start thinking about how to make it more effective by how we implement it. Uh, and this is why I, I like this, because towards the end, when we really start thinking about implementation, there's a lot of mixed methods involved, and I love mixed methods. So uh, we, can, we can develop strategies around uh, implementing something that's really good and that really works. Uh, and starting to think about how to use it and how to get people to use it or settings to use it. Or governments and policies, right? Uh, I'm going to briefly chat about uh, this hierarchy of evidence. What is evidence? This is supposed to be kind of like a critical, critical thought of how we look at evidence. But generally speaking, epidemiology, uh, the study of determinants, thinks that evidence should look this way. And you can already tell from the way I'm presenting it, my bias. But uh, we think that systematic reviews, right, pulling together all of those randomized controlled trials and actually seeing what is effective uh, is kind of the gold standard, right? But when we think about implementation, we can start to question uh, just what is valid evidence or what should be evidence supporting the work that we're doing. Uh, and so what's wrong with this hierarchy of evidence that we oftentimes use? Well, many of you are engaged in working in real world settings, right? Randomized control trials, they're usually very clinical, very sanitized, very controlled by definition, right? And so how, how, how nicely does it mirror what's happening in real life, IRL, sorry for the, uh, Sorry for the slang. Um, and what do clinical trials and that evidence, for example, mean for different settings or different contexts? 
how generalizable are those results. And this is kind of where the fun stuff happens in implementation science, right? And so when we think critically about the evidence that we're using for whatever technology that we're interested in or whatever intervention we might be interested in, it really comes down to a question of, should we test an intervention, right? Like Billy Stick was a great example. It worked in some settings, but was it going to work on the Thailand Myanmar border? Not sure. So we really wanted to look at the effectiveness of it. Or should we study something that really works? It works everywhere. There's really, really great evidence to support it but it's still not being used regularly or wide, widely. And so maybe we should be asking questions around its implementation. So that's kind of where we sit in implementation science. And with this background, I went back to the Thailand-Myanmar border. Actually, this is still work that I was doing uh, while I came back to the States. But uh, the most recent publication that we came up with was uh, based on uh, Thinking about newborn care now, not just specifically related to jaundice, but actually a more comprehensive package of interventions that we can use for newborns. Uh, and this was uh, quite special because, as I mentioned before, since 2008, SMRU, where we did this work, and this wonderful, beautiful team that I get to work with, uh, they had been doing this for about 10 years. Uh, and what they had been doing is the best that they can do through continuous quality improvement, uh, using international guidelines and standards to the best of their abilities to implement newborn care in structured facilities that were, that were all along the border. And so we could look at this for the refugees and the migrants that, that this organization had been taking care of. And so what, what are those interventions? Um, so if you actually look at our systematic reviews, um, you know, there, there are certain key interventions that we know in low and middle income settings to be tried and true. We think these things work. These are evidence-based interventions. And what I'm showing here is essentially which ones were we able to do on the Thailand-Myanmar border. So the fully shaded circles are the ones that we did fairly well and regularly. Those uh, half-shaded circles maybe weren't so strong on. Uh, for reasons that I'll explain later in terms of the feasibility of doing those in that setting. And the ones that are empty circles, of course, are things that we just didn't do. But for the most part, hopefully you can appreciate that uh, for a resource-poor setting, we're, we're, I felt like we were doing pretty good. Um, and so more about the study, this is, this is a health post where you might actually receive antenatal care or pre, prenatal care for some of the pregnant women uh, in the border region. And some of the background and study aims, so like I mentioned before, there was this continuous quality improvement over the past 10 years. And there's another way that we can actually cut the data, the quantitative data. Uh, number one is we want to look at more mortality, morbidity in delivering these interventions, like how well did the babies do, right? Uh, another thing that we were able to look at was over time, if that process improved. And we could look at the initial part, the first few years of really establishing that care, to the second part of really expanding those interventions and the services, and then that third part where we were hoping that we were a well-oiled machine at that point. Um, and of course, because I was involved, I wanted to take an eye uh, to looking at implementation of these newborn interventions as a package. Uh, and the study design, mixed methods, of course. Um, uh, we, we were able to do a retrospective chart review from the, uh, the records for newborns. Uh, and I got to, uh, a really wonderful chance to talk to mothers who had actually received care in those newborn facilities. Uh, and we spent a lot of time discussing with the health workers who had been involved in delivering that care. So, like part one, uh, but this time we're using implementation science. So I went and I found some implementation outcomes to think about when I thought about this package of care. And some of the things that we talk about in impl implementation science are acceptability, appropriateness. Is it appropriate for the population that you're serving? Is it appropriate and acceptable to the health workers that are performing these services? A coverage, 
coverage is always a big question. So just because you provide services, does it actually reach who it needs to reach? Feasibility is a question of if you know to do it, can you actually do it? Which is a very, very important question in a lot of our settings. And fidelity. Once you have a protocol for something, once you know something should be done, how letter to the law do you stick? How well do you stick to that protocol as it was intended? So those are some of the implementation outcomes you might think about. So what do we see? Well, mortality, unfortunately, for the extremely preterm babies. So uh, I, I, I should say that we really looked at preterm babies, but because this was a package of care, right, we also saw very sick or small newborns. But for the most part, we could summarize a lot of the data really well for preterm births babies that were born too soon. And so we see that mortality doesn't really change for those very extremely preterm babies. Uh, but once we get to the very and moderate preterms, uh, you can see that that mortality rate really, really drops over time. And once again, this is showing those three time periods that I mentioned at the beginning, in the middle when we're expanding, and when we think we're a well-oiled machine. How much did it drop? Well, it was a lot. 68% and 53% mortality reduction in the very and moderate preterm neonates, respectively. Pretty big for our setting. So when we think about the implementation of these services, uh, I thought this was a particularly interesting finding that came out of a lot of the qualitative work that we did, which was, and I, and I hate to make light of it, but I always think of song lyrics. So the first cut is the deepest, right? So coverage. Coverage was really the biggest thing, and it was about access. And so these women had a really, really hard time getting to the services that we knew would help them. Uh, and this was because of a number of factors, poor infrastructure, financial burdens in trying to get refugees or migrants to clinics on time, and you know, having undocumented status. That was a real problem for these women in actually accessing services. So that was the first cut that I thought was kind of the biggest blow to a lot of the work that we were doing. The next cut is still pretty deep too, though. Uh, and this is around limited resources for quality, ensuring quality health services, right? And so as many of us know, uh, probably in some of the places that you work in Sub-Saharan Africa, and this is definitely a case in, on the Myanmar-Thailand border, uh, the health staff were really creative, but a lot of times they, they did this because they needed to adapt certain things because of the environmental or financial constraints that they were facing, right? So it, they had to be creative uh, because of the resource limitations. And this really affects feasibility, right? So it, it really determines what interventions you can actually take on, right? When you're understaffed or under-resourced, that, or without backup to take care of equipment, for example. And it also affected the fidelity by which we could deliver the interventions as they are prescribed. So I'd like to kind of wrap up, but I did want to give you some more fodder for, oh, fantastic. We got some time for discussion. Uh, we're going until 2.30, right? OK, perfect. So I want to know your thoughts. Uh, thank you very much for your time and, and patient attention. Um, uh, and I know that there are some students, there are some fellows here. So uh, I really care about health access, and that's how I kind of came upon these, these issues or, or thinking about these, these uh, uh, problems. Uh, but what have you learned about context and how important is it? Context and setting. And I would invite you to Teach me about the context in which you work and how that might affect some of the technologies or the interventions that you guys have been thinking about. Um, another part that I want to hit on is this idea. I, I, I mentioned that I was hoping to get more and more sophisticated. And part of that sophistication is this movement from vertical programming to horizontal programming. right? And I think you guys talk about it in your courses. And you talk about it in your work. But jaundice, you know, our initial first couple studies that we were talking about, was very vertical in approach, right? It was very disease focused. 
And then we move towards a package of newborn interventions, not just for jaundice, but for a number of newborn issues. And so, what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> and then, this is the problem that I ran into. You know, just by establishing and implementing services, these guys did a really good job. Like, there were times where I turned to myself and I was like, what am I doing here? What am, what am I supposed to help you guys with? Y'all are doing great. But um, I wanted you guys to think about this because I know that you guys are always thinking about technology or how we can leverage what we know or, or different interventions to be designed. Uh, but it made me think about what is the added benefit of the things that we do in these settings. For example, we don't do CPAP. Um, and, and I think this program works a lot on that topic. But when we thought about it, uh, we realized that probably 2 to 7% of our very preterm neonates would have been eligible for that. And it would have saved a number of lives. That's no small number of lives. Any newborn life saved is, is important. But it made me wonder about you know, thinking about what it would look like to put CPAP, for example, or other potential technological or other innovations in this setting. And do we need to think about its efficacy and effectiveness and consider at what cost? Right? So a lot of the things that came out of that last study that we did was about how understaffed and under-resourced people are, that if they take on a new technology, how strapped are they going to be? So, so I don't just think about the cost of the tool itself, but also the cost for that context or that setting that you might be implementing it in. So those are some questions for you guys. But that's really all I had. And I open it for questions or discussions. Yeah, already. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're absolutely right. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'll go back to that slide so people can see, too. Or it might be hard to go back to this slide. No worries, no worries. And, and, and while he is looking up his slide, I want to invite those who are online to submit any questions via chat. We are monitoring the chat box. Yeah, so the question was about kangaroo care, uh, which is a tried and true intervention. And as uh, you pointed out, a low-cost intervention, and the reasons why we don't do it on the Thailand Myanmar border. And they have tried it. Uh, it turns out that it was hard to convince the communities to want to do it. Uh, and so there's a, there's a cultural preference for swaddling the children, uh, and it was a really hard habit to break, and we didn't quite figure it out. Yeah? <laughs> I, I think it's a great, it, it's one of the things that we talked about in our discussion in our last paper as one of those things where like, well, maybe we should try harder, maybe we should revisit this topic, you know, because it, it's a great question. I mean, this is an intervention that works. We know the evidence, right? We were talking about evidence. This one's a fantastic one, but it's just not, it doesn't just, it just doesn't jive with the communities. So, any other Thoughts, ideas, questions? In thinking about the intervention as a whole, um, what would you share as the main lessons learned for other programs that um, are also interested in reducing newborn mortality? What are the things that had the most contribution to being able to have such a um, significant reduction in mortality? Great question. Um, I think it was the will to actually do it. So like I said, in 2008, there was a big push by local, honestly, it came from the communities. The healthcare workers were tired of losing babies, to say, to put it frankly. And they, they were able to work with some of the researchers from the University of Oxford to actually develop the facilities necessary to provide adequate care to as many newborns as they could. And so it really came from the communities to want to, want to do this. 
Um, I think the lessons learned are that you probably don't need a ton of stuff. Kangaroo care, for example, is a great, great intervention. But maybe just the mindset of thinking about not just one, one of the problems in newborn care, but think of it as a package which, of course, we're not always at liberty or luxury to do in a lot of resource-limited settings. I think the other thing that we add here is also thinking about implementation and uh, starting to generate a little bit of evidence and thought and hopefully dialogue and discussion around how we uh, characterize what we're doing and how we study what we're doing and making sure that we're doing the right things. Yeah, go for it. Thanks. You raise a lot of really important points, and I'm glad you. I'm glad you mentioned culture because it's such a critical role, and, and we do a study in one country and how applicable it is to another country in terms of those interventions. Right. Um, maybe just talking a little bit more about when we think about in, uh, innovation and we think about interventions, oftentimes our minds go to immediately developing the new greatest and latest technologies, when in reality sometimes the newest innovation around an intervention is how we, an innovative way to implement it, especially yeah. in a low-cost setting. Right. And so thinking about what your findings were in this particular setting, what would be your recommendations in other low-income settings that are, you know, say in sub-Saharan Africa, um, which again, we talk about sub saharan Africa like it's one, like everything is the same, but every, there's a lot yeah. of different countries and cultures and cultural context right. in sub saharan Africa. So thinking about these interventions, and we're doing a lot of them already, but how do we create a stronger package of interventions, especially training healthcare providers, or if you've got low liter literacy or moderate literacy healthcare providers, like community healthcare workers, how can they play a role in all of this in these particularly low income settings? So creating right. that strong package of services, keeping in mind that cultural context and then the cost of implementing it. Sort of right. how do we then apply it to other countries? Yeah, uh, that's a really important and fantastic question that I, I don't know that I have the answer to. But I, I think part of it, or part of what we've learned, is, uh, again, going to the establishment kind of piece, right? Like, a lot of these local healthcare workers have been trained in emergency obstetric care, neonatal resuscitation, right? Like, your, your bread and butter practices of saving lives. Period. Um, I think uh, I think you raise a really really great point about cultural uh, you know considerations and the context. I should be, always be a part of it. But uh, yeah, I guess that goes back to this question of like it, it pushed me to think about moving from vertical to horizontal. And for example, it pushed me to think about social determinants. Right. So those women. The first cut was the deepest. Women not being able to access the facility. So where should I be spending my time or efforts or money or funding? Uh, and so we've been, we've been developing programs that are mobile outreach for antenatal care, for example, on the border to actually reach the women where they are uh, to form a continuity of care. But this is an implementation science question. So congratulations. You now have a research agenda for us all. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a question. Sure. Um, so I know as we think about our work, local ownership mm. is really key. And I, I believe, if I'm understanding correctly, the program that you presented is NGO based. And I guess I'd yep. like to understand what partnership there was with the government, especially mm. sort of that, that what's the sustainability of the work? And, um, and if I can sort of tack on to that, thinking about the feasibility of the work, right? Like the, the lack of, if there is lack of buy-in, right? How much that might have changed mm. the feasibility of some of the, implement, of the interventions that were being implemented. Yeah, I think kangaroo care is a great, great example of that uh, last point that you brought up. In terms of the sustainability, once again, you know, it, this, this group was a University of Oxford group, but it wore both hats. It did research, and it did applied research, and before the term was coined, implementation research uh, for the populations and the health services that they were delivering. So they had an, a, a research hat, but at the same time, they were still about establishing clinical care and the best that they can do with the guidelines, international guidelines, and, and that which they had. Uh, but it is externally funded, so the question of sustainability is is always going to be there. So, so even if you had local ownership, like even aside from this group, right, uh, 
you see uh, local ownership or, um, for example, Thailand itself, where, where this work was taking place, but the country as a whole for their own national citizens, citizenry. You know, you have NGOs, for example, PATH, one of the, one of the groups that I, an NGO that's headquartered in Seattle, uh, they closed their office in Thailand uh, because they were like, Thailand's doing well. We don't, we don't see a use for us right now. But with that change of ownership, that also limited the funding that the new Thai NGO could actually acquire to do some of the work that I wanted to do. So uh, sustainability, yeah, uh, it's going to be a constant question. I don't know that I necessarily have an answer or gave you a favorable answer. So I apologize if I didn't. We have a couple more minutes. Time for maybe one more question online or in the room. Oh, yeah. Any questions online? Okay. I, I think you've answered all the questions. Wow. Everybody should know everything, right? About uh, implementation science. Well, if you guys know everything, <laughs> please teach me. Um, but yeah, thank you for your time. Um, feel free to reach out to me. I'm around. I'm, I'm literally across the street, apparently. Um, and I also just wanted to point out a lot of our partners going back to the sustainability, right? Like this work wouldn't have happened without the support of all these wonderful organizations and, and academic institutions. So, but thank you guys. <laughs>